to share that with you today. Uh. It's going to be line players. Uh, I did quite well there, but I decided after a couple of years I had enough. There was no future. I was uh, not going to go up to the major leagues for any length of time and stay. Uh, the duration uh, of my career was rather short. Michael Steele's story is decidedly different from other black athletes we often hear or read about. When his career ended, he didn't fall tragically by the wayside or become involved with illegal drug use, as have other black athletes like Michael Ray Richardson, John Drew, Chris Washburn, or Marvin Bad News Barnes. Steele decided he could make bank after basketball by using his brains. Unlike those fallen heroes, Michael Steele traded in basketball for the business world. And now he heads a multi-million dollar operation promoting Coca-Cola products and earning a hefty six-figure pro basketball-like salary as coach director of black consumer markets. It's the sort of transition only a rare few black sure athletes fair, have ever yeah. made successfully. Um, Chris Washburn and some of these other guys are, uh, have problems. There's uh, clearly some guys uh, that are white that have problems. Uh, the issue, I think, is in our community, let's focus on positive role models for our youth today. And we have them. I think it takes an effort much like this to seek those young men out. We're going to shoot the commercial next Friday. Will you be there, Renee? What he does now is much like those exciting days he spent running back and forth with one purpose in mind, to score. Now he's scoring big profits for Coke against Pepsi as the point guard for marketing campaigns and promotional programs targeted to black consumers. He's also the executive producer of these popular TV commercials. Yes! That's my Michael. Can't beat the real thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, some very uh, old footage <laughs> that I thought I had gotten rid of. And I saw them trying to get it to work, and I was over there sitting with the group praying, please don't let it run. <laughs> My sons uh, actually uh, uh, loaded it uh, or uploaded it to YouTube. Can you hear me back there? <laughs> uploaded it to YouTube. And he told me, he said, Dad, he said, I took that video. And he was just laughing. I put that video, I put that on YouTube. And me and my friends, we just really, Dad, we, he's just laughing. And I said, wow, I was feeling really good. I said, did you like that, son? He said, those shorts. <laughs> that was so funny. He didn't even think about the content of what his dad was doing. All he thought about was the shorts I had on. I can't believe you wore those little bitty shorts. <laughs> I am thrilled to be here, and I am excited. I was here last year, and, and uh, Mr. Harris, is he here? Uh, good, he's outside, that's good. <laughs> and Mr. Harris didn't give me enough time. And, and, and I was disappointed, and I, I, you know, I've been pulled off of stages before, but uh, last year, I, it was a bit abrupt. And so uh, I, I was very fortunate that, that, that he would ask me back, so I asked for more time. So, uh, and then my staff tried to use it up, trying to get that old video to play. <laughs> i tell you something that's really interesting. Those young ladies in that video are uh, pioneers, uh, as we were pioneers. Uh, the one young lady uh, 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 that you saw in the video is now the CEO of Burrell Advertising in Chicago, one of the largest advertising agencies in the country. Uh, and the other young lady is the executive vice president of a competing agency, which I won't name because they're one of my competitors. But it's just amazing to see what, t what time will do. Uh, I have with me uh, some uh, associates that I'd like to recognize before I get started. And I'm going to go through uh, my work pretty quickly, and I'd like to leave some time, if I may, for questions and answers, if you agree with that, P particularly with Mr. Harris not being here. <laughs> I also want to recognize a couple of leaders, too, because that's important. I'm a big fan of leadership, and much of what I'm going to talk about is about leadership, but I see uh, Ron in the back, and, and I tell you, boy, what a class act. How are you, sir? Great. Yes, sir. Can we give him a hand? I had a 10-minute meeting with him that lasted about an hour and a half. 
By the time we finished, boy, we had just about talked about everything you can think of, and I just really enjoyed the time. Thank you. And then Director Williams, is he here? Ah, that's good. I'm going to take advantage of that as well. <laughs> He's also a very fine leader that I enjoy. Uh, my associates are here. Uh, uh, these are some of the hardest working people in the business. Uh, you, you, you look at quality people, and you look at people that you can trust and rely on, and uh, I believe the first or second person here this morning was Whitney Albert, and she's over there. If you just raise your hand. And, and I often talk about Whitney because Whitney is a very unusual young lady. She came to us, hello there. She came to us uh, uh, from uh, uh, University of uh, Central Arkansas, and she knocked on the door and she said, look, I want to get a job. And I, yeah, I, I can help your company. And I said, well, ma'am, I don't know how you got an appointment here. I said, we, we don't hire anybody right out of college. You have to have some experience. And so I kind of kicked her out of the office. And, uh, and I turned around a couple of days later. She was back interviewing with somebody else in the office. And I said, my goodness, I just tossed that lady out of the office. And, and I said, mm. So I went back and I said, well, look, ma'am, I said, I told you, you don't have any experience. You know, you, you know come back in a couple of years. And a couple of weeks later, I was in the office and she was interviewing with somebody else. And I said, my goodness, this lady is the most persistent lady. I mean, I didn't toss her out of here twice. I said, I'm going to give her the boot really good this time. And I went and met with her and said, look, I like you. You're really kind of interesting. Get out. <laughs> and she said, I want a job. And I said, this is not a job. This is a career. This is a commitment. And she says, I'm willing to make that commitment. And so uh, she left, and for sure she called me and said, sir, I know you put me out three times, but I'm willing to work for free. I'll do whatever it takes to get be a part of your team. I said, my goodness, okay, let's give her a chance. I gave this woman so much work to do, it would choke a horse. She stayed in the office night and day, night and day. And I said, oh my God, put her on the payroll. That's Whitney Albert. <laughs> I tell you, that every good organization has a good right hand, and I have one, and that's Nigel Hall. Nigel Hall is with me also today. Nigel Hall is a fantastic man. I met Nigel, and Nigel was, you know, he's been around a long time with me. We've been working together for almost eight, nine years. And I asked Nigel, I said, why should you come to work for Advantage Communications? And he said, sir, and he put his hand on his chin, And he put his fingers up like this. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I have four boys. <laughs> I said, my God, you need a job. <laughs> Nigel manages most of our uh, consumer research and focus group. Does a fantastic job for us and is a, a dear friend and associate. Very rare you find someone you can consider a friend and work with. And uh, Nigel Hall is a good friend as well. Thank you, Nigel, for being here. All right, uh, last but not least is uh, uh, Danny. Uh, Danny's back there on the, on the camera, and, uh, and this was, I believe, either it was Ron's doing or Director Williams doing was to record this session, and this may be a quality con control issue, concerned about what I may say. <laughs> so whatever I say, let's make sure we keep it between us and I'll get the tape from Danny afterwards. <laughs> My mission statement speaks to the company. This mission statement is pretty clear. It says that we are basically servants. I built an organization based on a concept of servant leadership. It says to serve our clients, to serve our associates. The whole platform of our business is that I am the lowest ranking officer in the company. I have a fancy title, but my job is to make sure that she's successful and he's successful and the 13 others within the organization. That's my job. We call that concept servant leadership. Serve. And I often struggled when I was at Coca-Cola company, how do you get people to follow you? Because at, at, at the Coca-Cola company, I made a lot of mistakes. And after you make so many mistakes, people began not to follow you. Oh, I did, I did. I worked on New Coke. Some of you may be old enough to remember New Coke. It was a brilliant idea at the time. 
But when I looked behind me, my team wasn't there, <laughs> as I was one of the pioneers for the brand new Coke. Servant leadership is what we do. We serve our community, we serve our clients, we serve each other. We see each other as customers. Quite a different uh, way to model a company, isn't it? We see each other as customers. So my job is to serve Whitney and the staff, and her staff. And they keep me very, very busy. Uh, our leadership uh, has said that they were challenging government agencies to improve customer service and customer satisfaction via an executive order. This is uh, not a surprise, as corporate America is also retooling and adjusting in every aspect to survive the economic downturn. Companies are making dramatic changes in the way they do business. Companies that don't understand this change and organizations that don't understand this change expire. And here's what I mean. One of the largest film producing companies in the world, one of the largest, in fact, the largest film producing company in the world lost sight of their customer. And a few years ago, that company closed its doors. Who was that company? Kodak. How can that happen? When you lose sight of your customer, your destiny is already predetermined. They lost sight of their customer. How could you stand by and watch digital and not move? They were sleep at the wheel. Sleep at the wheel. Many folks ask, why in the, in the world would you advertise brand Coca-Cola? You advertise brands like, brands like Coca-Cola for one reason. The brand is a very, very old brand, a very, very mature brand. You advertise for one reason. And a lot of folks will say, you advertise for awareness. No, you don't. You advertise for relevance. Because if you become irrelevant to your customer, you're doomed. The same thing applies to you. You're facing the complexity of your customer base today. You call them clients. I, I call them customers. Those customers of yours today are very, very different than they were yesterday. Now, if you came along during my time, they called us the baby boomers. We were fairly easy, less complicated. Today, you deal with a consumer or a customer that sits in front of you, and he's or she has their phone out and they're texting and they're just looking away from you and you're trying to talk to them and establish a communications and you're wondering, what the, what's going on here? And they're just texting, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you are talking to what we define as millennials. If you don't understand millennials, then you can't relate to your customer. And that's what happened to these big companies. They just lost their perspective. They lost the sight of their customer. If you lose sight of the customer, you're in trouble. You're doomed because those millennials are communicating in a medium that they understand. You don't understand it. They understand it. The report says, data says that 35, 30 emails are down 35%. Can you imagine that? Email volume globally is down 35%. Why? I have two of them. Lord knows I need help. I can call them. They won't answer. I text them. They respond right back. That makes me so mad. I'm, my goodness. I want to have a conversation. As they say, I want to conversate. <laughs> they don't conversate. The culture is different. It's different. So you have to know your customer too. Amen? Good. Here's a brand. Here's a brand that's studying to learn their customer. I like picking on him. I'm glad he's not here today. <laughs> and don't y'all tell him what I said about him. But this is a brand. This brand is so consistent, isn't he? He's so consistent. He's consistent with his messaging. He's consistent with his look. He's consistent all the way down to his shoes. And he will tell you, those are called brand standards. You have brand standards too. 
And think about it, because each of you are a brand. You are a brand. When your customer is sitting across from you, they see a brand, particularly millennials. Millennials are so different, so, so I call them weird because they're my sons too, I include them. They can't relate to home phones. They can't even understand what that concept. They, to them, that's the dumbest thing in the world. How many of us have a home phone? Raise your hand. There you go. And they're looking at you. That is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Why would you have a landline phone and all you got to do is reach in your pocket, Dad? They think differently. The customer is different. They also grew up technically savvy. Take the computer apart, put it back together, and barely get out of high school. <laughs> Take it apart, put it back together, and look at you like, what's wrong with you? My son took my phone, took it apart, and took this little card out and put it, and put it in somebody else's phone. What did you do? <laughs> uh, so what do you call them? That's it. Put it back. <laughs> Put it back. Know your customer. So many of the young folks that sit across from us are millennials. Their behavior is different. It's on us to understand them. It's for us to, sh to share with them our brand story and understand them. This journey here, this mission here, this good to great is something very, very serious. This is not a joke. If, if, if you don't understand good to great, then I'm going to break it down today so that we can talk about it. Good to great is a transition in which America is going through today. If, in fact, you are an organization and your organization does not plan growth, what happens? You die. You expire. You become the Kodak. Good to great is about transforming organizations from average to great. It is about public sector and private sector. Public sector, public sector says, I need to cascade the organization for good to great for efficiency basis. So I need to improve efficiencies and processes and standards and everything that I need to do to become a better organization and the most efficient organization for survival, as we have not seen anything like we are about to see in terms of limited resources and budget cuts. That's just the reality. You can look at the deficit and you can say, we got to figure this out, but eventually something's going to happen pretty dramatically and we have to make adjustments now, and that's what good to great is all about. Um, if, I were, if I were the CEO of the Coca-Cola Company, Good to great would be about capturing as much profits as I could and, and, and putting assets away as quickly as I could. And that's what corporate America is doing. And what they're not doing is what? Hiring. I heard it. Hiring. That's cost. Good to great is about survival. Good to great is about transitioning average organizations to great. At Advantage Communications, as small as we are, an organization of some 20 people, we do the same thing. We had to retool our organization to understand what is needed for us to be successful. Where do we have a competitive advantage? And how can we outservice our clients better than anybody else? Exactly what you are doing here in your journey from good to great. We spent about a year in the field when uh, the process was called an environmental scan. That environmental scan included talking to many of you in this room and your customers or your clients as you define them. And we asked them a series of questions about service levels and about their perception of you and their perception of the service. And then tomorrow, I believe it's tomorrow, I'm here to share the results of that research with you, which is absolutely phenomenal. Good to great is about transforming yourselves as well. You cannot stay where you are. If you stay where you are, you become, don't tell anybody I said this, it's just between us. If Whitney Albert does not grow, what happens to her? Amen.
she goes into the abyss. So you constantly have to retool yourself. You constantly have to grow and transition your brand. Every brand has to grow. Every brand has to be relevant. Every brand, especially your brand, every day. Today, I, I, am, I am known as a marketing guru. I work feverishly to understand every new marketing medium there is out today. There was no social media when I graduated from college. Today, I am a social media expert. I have to retool my brand. I have to retool my brand to create value. When I was at the Coca-Cola company, they, they sent me to Europe to work. And I was in France. And I had a pro the problem in France was how do I convince young French people, young French kids, to drink, to drink more soft drinks than wine? Now, that was a dilemma. <laughs> First thing I had to do was I had to learn to speak French. Come on, tell a vous. <laughs> so you retool your brand. And you retool yourself over and over and over again to keep up with the needs of your role in your jobs today because everything around you is changing. Every person you see around you is changing. Organizations must continually improve to, 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 to better serve clients. That's the reality. If we don't improve our infrastructure here in TANF, and I'm, I, I have a special, a specialness for TANF because I think TANF is the group of folks that, that can accelerate the whole movement for DWS. I think TANF is an organization that can accelerate and develop a standard for our state government that's unprecedented. I see this group, this group, as the leaders. I don't have any problems with the other groups. But this group is the leader. DWS has an opportunity to serve as best practices for the state. See, if we retool our brand, we become the model for which others will follow. Amen? That's the truth. Now, let me tell you, I work with a lot of state agencies. And yesterday, I won't mention the group I was with, but they were, what are you doing over there? What are you doing? What is Advantage Communication doing over there with that group TANF? Because we want to outdo them. And I said, well, you know, I have, I have limitations of what I can say. You know, Mr. Harris is pretty tough on me. I, I have limitations. We signed confidentiality agreements. And those directors said, forget that confidentiality. We want to do, we want to be the leader. We want to be the best, not TANF, not DWS. We want to be the best. Everybody recognizes the need to retool the organization. Everyone recognizes that. The economy dictates it. Survival dictates it. Just look at the unemployment rate. And look who's unemployed. And I said this last year. The unemployment rate is not full of high performers. That 9% unemployment are not those exceptional workers. Exceptional workers find jobs. That, that, that juggernaut out there, that 9% unemployment are those folks that were average performers. Because we call that pruning in corporate America. Pruning. Uh, many years I sat in corporate uh, America and we went through the process, well, the economy's down. Well, Mike, profits are up. Yes, they are up. Well, our, our earnings per share, uh, uh, we're, we're doing great. We're up. Coca-Cola stock selling at $88. Yeah, we're up. Uh, and then management says, then cut 3,000 heads. It's called pruning. Pruning, the pruning of America. Those are average performers. Only average performers have challenges. Exceptional folks, exceptional managers that retool their brand have longevity. They create a need for their position. And if you look at young people like Ms. Albert, Ms. Albert is the first one in my office every morning typically the last one to leave every morning. She creates value. Now, when it comes to compensation, she creates too much value, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's time to shift our culture from a client base. Clients are like, and I said this the other day, and I got in trouble, it was with Ron and some guys. Clients, are, that's like a lawyer relationship. Clients, these aren't clients, they're customers. 
These people come to us and they're asking for services that we render. They're, 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 they are customers. And, and, and if we don't do a good job, then it's an encumbersome relationship, isn't it? Isn't it? It's tough. It's tough. And sometimes the younger they are and the more they fall into that whole millennial area, then the more challenging it is. Now, I'm not saying that all of our customers are millennials, because someone sent me a note and said, everybody's not a millennial. Well, I, I know that, but I'm, I'm speaking to the future of our business. There's 80 million of them. It's 80 million of them coming. It's not going to get better. <laughs> 80 million coming, like my sons. What a challenge. It's time to shift the culture from client base to customers. Because if you, if you interface with these people as customers, then the dynamics are different. Because all of a sudden, when you start treating them like customers, they say, oh, OK, let me put this away. Because you're talking to them about products and product benefits and things that they can resonate with versus process and procedures. You can't communicate process and procedures to my son. He doesn't follow the rules. He's a rule breaker. He wants to go to college his own way, not my way. We had a family meeting recently, and we said, OK, look, you have a chance to speak up and talk about any of the issues that you want to address, son. So what issues do you have for your dad? I want to make my own decisions. OK, you're very, very poor, but OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's a reality. Your customers are also internal. I spend a lot of time with you. How you interface with each other is critical. Your customers to each other. You're serving each other. Because what we have to do here in this organization is break down the silos. We have too many silos. We got the smartest people in state agencies and government right here, but we have silos that have developed over the years. And you can call those silos whatever you want to call them. You know them better than I do, but there are silos that exist, and we need to cross that bridge and start treating each other like customers and serving each other. And when we serve each other, then the politics go away. The only politics we're concerned about is success. Success. And can my pockets jingle a little more each year? <laughs> success. But this is an opportunity for us to transform state government. All the way to Governor Beebe. Everybody's in alignment. Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. Or we expire. Because if we don't fix it, if we don't fix it, then there are massive cuts about to come. We have to fix it. We got to cross lines. We got to be UI and we got to be TANF. Oh, I said the bad word. I said it. We got to do what we have to do to survive. We have to be smarter and better, and the old school stuff doesn't work in the new school environment. Your customers ex externally, externally, your customers are everyone that you touch. You are a brand. You are a brand. At, at Advantage Communications, if you come to visit us, there's, there's beverages waiting for you and cookies and whatever refreshments we can offer you. And, 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 and that includes even our vendors that we pay. It's customer service. It's my brand image. Because I tell you, I've had some vendors that leave my office and say, wow, I've never been treated so nice. And then they send me referrals. Why does that cost me a cup of coffee? External customers are critical because that's your brand. That's the perception of TANF. The perception that you create about your brand is you. I have never seen a better looking group of folks, more handsome, well-dressed, well-educated, smart as the Dickens than this group here. Than this group right here. We need to make sure that every time that, that, that we interface with someone that we manage our brand, that they understand what the deal is. And the deal is, is that we're flying here. We're not better than anybody else, but we're flying here. Because I can't lift you up if I'm down with you. If you, if you, if you dwell in the sewer, you're going to stink. 
Good to great is about selecting those people that are on board, those people that have compassion about what they do, those people that believe in what they do. Ain't no better opportunity. I, I, I love working with you. I, I have never impacted so many people. I sit in focus groups and talk to your clients, and I just scratch my head and say, wow, what a difference we make every day. Every day. How many people have that opportunity in their lives? There are many people that spend their lives putting spark plugs in engines all day for 35 years, and you're changing lives, impacting lives. You're changing the destiny of our state. Now here we are though, here we are. Here's the tough part. Good to great. Good to great is all about getting the right people. In the book, if you read the book, it says get the right people on the bus. So I have to probe, and Mr. Harris has to probe, and Ron, and leadership has to probe, and we gotta get the right people, the best people that we can, and you gotta put the, the best people in the right jobs. If the best, if, if you have good talent and they're in the wrong job, you fail. You fail. We have to get the right people on the bus in the right seats. We gotta get the right people on the bus in the right seats. That simply means what you do best is what you should be doing every day. Every day. What you do poorly, you shouldn't do it. Bad part is, those with bad attitudes, get them off the bus. Get them off the bus. If you don't get them off the bus, they'll drag you down. If you don't like your job, get out. Get the right people on the bus, and the bus will carry you to a destiny that's unprecedented in customer service. You will change the destiny of our state. Get the wrong people off the bus. If you're not happy, go somewhere else. If you pouting, go home. If you don't want to go from good to great, leave. 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 The reality, the reality is that the bus cannot reach its destination with haters. I did the same thing in my company. I had some knuckleheads in my company. I'm reading good to great and I said, Hmm. Hmm. Let me call a meeting here. <laughs> Do you like your role here? Do you don't like your role here? Then get off the bus! <laughs> I did it. We are now smaller. Smaller. More efficient more profitable, happier than the Dickens. And the haters are outside the door looking in. That's what good to great's all about. It's a journey. It's a healthy journey. That's what President Obama's talking about, good to great. He didn't use the words. I didn't want to endorse the book. I can. That's what it's about. You can't do your job if you got somebody nagging you about all the negativity that's going on in the world. We can't fix all of that. I got people out here that need services. I got to go to work. I don't have time for that nonsense. There are some standards of excellence in place. This is serious stuff. At the agency, we had a notification to bid for General Motors, for some work for General Motors. This little bitty agency in Little Rock, Arkansas, we got notifications, and all the big agencies, they got notifications as well. So all the CEO big shots, we all got together, and they said, 
<clears throat> we think this is a waste of time. And uh, we're, we're not going to respond to that. And they says, we know you're not going to respond, Mike. And I just smile. I came back to the office and said, get ready, we're responding. <laughs> agency, low agency from Arkansas. Low agency from Arkansas. General Motors. I'm sitting at the office. Phone rings. A young lady said that this is General Motors calling. I said, yeah, yeah, can you call back, ma'am? I'm, I'm a little busy. And I, I snapped to my senses and said, oh my God, was that General Motors for real? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thank God I got her number before I, I, I hung up. <laughs> I called her back and she said, you won the bid. Welcome to the General Motors family. This little bitty agency. Good to great. I left them haters. <laughs> I left them. Good to great. The account executive for General Motors is Miss Whitney Albert. Will you please stand, man? We flew into Detroit. They said, what are y'all doing in Arkansas? So the same thing y'all do in Detroit. <laughs> We work harder than most people in Arkansas. We're the smartest people in Arkansas. And I'll be <clears throat> at my best to say, we will over-deliver for you, sir. We will over-deliver. And they have been very, very pleased. And we're working on a renewal of our contract now. That's good to great. <laughs> that, that, it does, doesn't happen without standards, though. Because we have standards at Advanced Communications. You can't come in there late. <laughs> we, we, we have the big three. Three times, don't come back. <laughs> don't come back. Don't come back. I have no use for you. Good to great is about the best. I can't even imagine sitting down talking to somebody about coming to work on time. I can't even imagine me talking about coming to work on time. Well, I got too much to do. I don't even want to talk about that. Get off the bus. What I look like talking about, uh, uh, can you get to work on time, please? <laughs> you know, can you, can you try to just get to work on time? The standards of excellence have been set by this team, and I absolutely love them. It says, demonstrate a spirit of service. If you serve people, they will follow. Now, you've got you, you, you to gotta follow this. If you serve people, they follow. So many folks wonder, how do I get people to, to follow me? How do you get people to follow you? You get people to follow you by serving them. You serve them. They will follow you. You can't just say, well, I'm the big shot. Hey, <clears throat> follow me. I got the position. I don't care if you got the position or not. If you don't serve me, I'm not following you. <laughs> serve, 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 serve each other. Serve, serve. Now, it is written in a book, and I won't even go there, but you can find it easy. Build and maintain relationships. That's what this is about. This is when we cut the deal. You want to get promoted. I want to get promoted. Let's develop a game plan. How are we going to work with Mr. Harris? Because we both need to get promoted. But we can't do this if we're attacking each other. We got to do this together. <laughs> so I got your back. You got my back. If, if, if I got your back, you got my back, then we're going to... We're going to get Mr. Harris. Pocket going to jingle. <laughs> it's about relationships. You got to work together. You got to work together. You can't do this by yourself. You can't do this by yourself. You got to work together. It's about relationships, working with each other. Now, you don't have to love each other. I don't want to go to dinner with my staff, my team. I like them. But I don't want to go to dinner after all them hours. I want to go home and get away from them. But while we're together, 
It's game time. It's game time. Game on. And game on doesn't start at start time. I cannot believe how many folks come to work at start time. That just drives me crazy. Now, we start at advanced communications at 8 o'clock. You walk in there at 8, 8 o'clock, you late. You late. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Because that employee that, that, that needs to boot, they come in at 8 o'clock, what are they going to do? They're going to leave at 4.30, that's for sure. That's right, go get a cup of coffee. So I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. I know some of y'all mad at me, I know that. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. I'm going to get a cup of coffee. And then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to kick it with my girls. And, and, and girl, did you see that last night? And, and, and then, oh, let me check my emails. And now it's 10.30. Get off the bus. You can't survive like that. Now here's the deal. Here's the deal. Take that hour times five. One hour times five. Times 52. My goodness. How much does that cost? Times 300 people. What an efficiency. Inefficiency. What a waste. What a waste. What a waste. What a waste. Now, there's some rules that you have to govern yourself by. And we can't demand that people come to work any earlier because it's against the law. I know that. I know some of y'all saying, that's against the law. It is. <laughs> and I don't want to break the law. But I want the right people on the bus. And I want the wrong people off the bus. Because that hour each day, just think about it. That same employee, your friend, start work at 9, 9.30, go to lunch, take that extraordinary bathroom break a couple times a day. <laughs> Next thing you know, that person worked about five, six hours a day. Now, you were in there from 7.30 to 5.15, 5.30. You done seen twice as many people. You done, done twice the work and you look at her, and y'all make the same amount of money, and you say, get off the bus! <laughs> Let me tell you something. I know, I know, I know, I know the director would be upset with me. I know he'd be upset with me. Don't y'all tell him. But, but that's stealing. That's stealing. That's stealing! Now, you do that at advanced communications, you might last a week. Inspire the shared vision. Everybody here should read Good to Great. We have a book here. If you haven't seen it, buy the book, Good to Great. Please, please, please read it. If you read it, you have a competitive advantage because only 10% of you are going to do it. That 10%, I see you in management. <laughs> Be recognized as innovators. Change things. Change things. If it's broke, fix it. If it's broke, fix it. If it doesn't work, go report it to the highest authority you can find. If it's broke, fix it. I had a young lady come to me and tell me, said, uh, uh, Mr. Steele, uh, your printer is cartridge needs to be replaced. OK. Now, I'm thinking now, testing my own competencies. Now, where would I find the cartridge so I could show her that she should take the initiative to do it herself instead of reporting the problem? If you report a problem, you are the problem. If you report the problem without a solution, you are the problem. Because it should go like this. Mr. Steele, your printer is out. The cartridge is bad. I have replaced it, and you're ready to go, sir. That's value. That's value. Self-initiative, you, you have to take the initiative to be your best every day. I, 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 I have never used an alarm clock. I know some people do. I, I, I just can't relate. 
Productivity. Name of the game. Here's the key to getting promoted. Outperform everybody at your table consistently. When I was at the Coca-Cola company, I started in the lowest position there. I started the lowest position there and I was an analyst and all those big heavy duty smart brainy birds would bring me all of their work to do, all of their analysis to do and say, give me analysis on Diet Coke. Give me analysis on Fanta. Give me this, give me that, give me this. I did it for almost two years. And one day they had a big meeting and they went into senior management and they made a presentation and senior management said, I like this analysis, but I have some questions. And they said, well, 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 well oh, <laughs> oh, um, I can't answer those questions, sir. He said, well, who did the analysis? He said, that kid down there still, that tall kid, he did the analysis. He said, then go get him. So he said to me, I came in the room and that was my first time. I had never really seen the man. I was like, wow, <laughs> this is pretty cool. <laughs> And he said, you did this analysis? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, do you do the analysis on all the brands? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you tell me the growth strategy for brand Coke? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, explain to me what we need to do. And so I went on for about 25 minutes, and then I stopped. And he says, I'll be. He said, can you give me a strategy for Diet Coke? What's the plan to grow Diet Coke? I said, yes, sir. And I went on, and, on, 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 on. and then the group said, well, sir, uh, uh, we want to go on with our presentation. He said, no, no, this meeting's over. He said, uh, 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 I want to talk to this kid. And he kept asking me questions and questions and probing how much I knew. And he said, you can go back to your station, your workstation. And I said, thank you. Three months after that, I was promoted. That group report to me. <laughs> True story. I just outworked them. They're from Harvard, Yale, Wharton, didn't matter. Most people are lazy. They won't put forth the effort. Most people are lazy. They won't put forth the effort. I will outwork you, I will outwork you, I will make you cry if you compete against me. <laughs> I'm willing to pay the price. I will stay with it and stay with it like you've never seen before. So if you come after me, you bring your lunch. <laughs> it's called conviction. Amen? Not me. Just I want to win. Respect for diversity, I won't go into, but diversity goes way beyond race. We face a lot of diversity today, a lot of divergent points of views. Diversity is, is key to our success in everything we do. The diversity issues for race are just absolutely incredible. Today, there are more brown, yellow kids being born than white today. Diversity. Some people suggested that the majority of the population would be minorities by year 20. 50, surprise, we're here today. And then focus on continuous improvement. I believe in this as well. I tell the team that all the time. You know, some folks say continuous praying. That's kind of what I believe in myself. Pray without ceasing, same kind of thing, same concept. Continuous improvement. I'm always retooling myself. If you're not investing 1% to 3% of your salary back in you, get off the bus. How, how, how can Mr. Harris, how can Mr. Harris, how can Ron, how can Mr. Williams, how can leadership invest in you if you don't invest in yourself? I got a real simple criteria. I watch young people in my office and watch them say, well, the company, will you pay for this seminar? Say, sure, sure, we'll pay for it. Sure, sure. But I'm looking to see what they're going to invest in. Because I want them to invest in themselves, too. You know, you, you, you. I didn't get here from Shorter Gardens without investing in myself. I bought books and I stood in front of mirrors and I practiced and I practiced. Would you believe I couldn't speak publicly? Could you believe that? Boy, Lord, really working with me, ain't he? I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Understand every day you are the brand. Every day. And that's one thing here, you folks were fantastic. You have to differentiate yourself from your customers. If you look like your customer, mm, mm, mm. don't get mad. I'm just telling the truth. If you look like your customer, 
get off the bus. If you look like your customer, something's wrong. That's like me dressing like my son. That's, that's, that's fundamentally wrong. Invest in yourself. You are the brand. You represent this department. You represent DWS. You represent TANF. And TANF is, a, is heads and shoulders above most. Recruit the best people. There is a fight for the best people. All you have to do is show your wares. Every state agency wants to be the best. And there's a fight for the best people. But if you don't champion your brand, it simply means if you don't tell your story, you don't wave your flag, you'll get overlooked. It's OK to champion your brand. It's OK to say that you're good. It's OK to say that you are the best. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to champion your brand. Cascade, we need to cascade our culture here to a culture of consistency. And I'm going to chat about that tomorrow a little bit, about standards. We have standards throughout our system, but they're largely ignored, aren't they? We have standards. We've called offices, and every time we call an office, it's a dis different answer. It's a different message. It's a different communications. We need to standardize our business. We need to standardize everything that we do. And then, once you standardize everything you do, then the performance metrics is easy. But when the performance, when the performance standards vary, you can't get promoted. So we got to standardize everything that we do. And then upon that platform, you launch your brand to greatness, good to great. The fundamentals of good to great, real quick, real quick. And I touched on this earlier, just never stop being qualified for your job. And that's a real problem, because particularly in an organization where you have longevity, always be qualified for your job. In fact, my approach to my, my career has been always to to look like I already had a nice job. Can you believe that? That was my philosophy. I don't want anybody to say, well, you know, he's promotable, but look at his shoes. <laughs> look at her dress. You take all those barriers away. You look like you own that job every day because that's what it's all about. You become promotable based upon what you, how you look and how you govern yourself. That's what's promotable because it removes what management calls the risk factors. Great. Uh, good to great. And I'm going to close on this. Our company, Advantage Communications, we won the General Motors business, but we also repeated and we won some other accounts that most people thought we couldn't. We compete against the largest agencies. We also charge the highest prices. You follow that? I charge the highest prices. I charge the highest price. <laughs> Costs for services are higher than my competitor, and they're 10 times as big as I am, and I did it on purpose because of the brand standards. This is what we represent, and it changes the dynamics when you think that of yourself. Now, I know Phil's not here, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to stop, because I know, is he, oh, he's here. He's here. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just don't tell him I said this. <laughs> Whenever you get your remuneration, your compensation, and God bless you. Be thankful for it, but it ain't never enough. <laughs> what I got to do to get more? What I have to give to get more? It's okay, because he wants that. And he'll say, let's lay out a plan to get you more. 20 years of Coca-Cola, 20 years of Coca-Cola, I went in front, I promise I'll shut up after this. I went in front of management, and management said, Mike, here's your, here's your raise. I look at it, and my heart would just start thumping. And in my head, I said, Lord, I have never seen this much money in my life. And then I looked at my management and said, sir, I'm disappointed. I thought that all I had given to this company that you would be fair to me, sir. And you know what they said? Well, we'll go back and take another look at it. I went, oh, Lord, can you believe that? <laughs> I'm going to call my mom and you would not believe with this. Oh, my God. See, it's what you think of yourself. It's what you think of yourself. 
your brand, your brand. And my reputation at Coca-Cola was, he's expensive, but he's going to get it done. I don't mind that. I don't mind that. He's expensive, but he's going to get it done. I don't quit. I don't go home. I, I'm over there early every day. I don't quit. You can, you can try anything you want to try. I am like a rock. I work with conviction to be the best every day. That's my brand story. So when I sit in front of those managers and I talk about my compensation, I've never been happy in 20 years. But every time I was jumping for joy because of my brand, you look like you deserve more. When you look like you deserve more, you get more. When you think you worth more, you get more. If you don't think you're worth it, then Mr. Harris is not going to think it either. If you look like it and you give more, you give more than you get. If you give more than you get, the equation is it's in your favor. Now, let me tell you something else now. There's the other side. These are the folks that we want to kick off the bus. You work for me. It's Coca-Cola philosophy, and I love it. You work for me. Come in on time. You leave on time. End of the year, we sit down. We don't have nothing to talk about. You work 40, I paid 40. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't give any extra. See, the golden goose is the one that gives more. It says in many leadership books, and my favorite leadership book says, the measure you give is the measure you get back. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>